Israelis visited him at his house in California, the Israeli consulate, and they said, look, Muhammad, we are your friend, you are our friend. We are having problems in the news. We would like you to go on a speaking tour of California universities and tell everybody how well we treat the Palestinians in Israel. Well, he refused, and they immediately canceled his lease on his own house and fired him from his job. And so Muhammad now found himself with his four daughters and his wife Layla stuck in the middle of California. And he was able to get a job. He was an agricultural specialist, so he was able to get a job with a company, which I'm sure none of you have ever heard of, called Ernest and Julio Gallo Wineries. And so this man, Muhammad, started teaching white people how to make wine. He was very good at it. And they gave him American citizenship as a result. And so that's how my mother ended up in California. My father was also a Palestinian refugee, born in Yaffa, raised in Amman. He ended up in California for a PhD in the 1970s, and they fell in love, they got married. It was the 70s, things were a lot more hippie. My dad was a, still is, my dad is a Christian, my mother is a Muslim, but they were both Palestinian, that's all that mattered. And they got married. They fell in love. They got married, they moved back to Jordan, they had me in 1977 in Jordan, then they got kicked out of Jordan in 1979, and they went back to America. Now, I know all of this sounds weird to most, but to Palestinians, this is pretty normal. Anyway, I tell you all of that to tell you this, even though I was born in Jordan and raised in the United States, I also hold an Israeli passport. Now, I always had the right to get it, thanks to an Israeli law that allows for the children born abroad of Israeli mothers to get their passport. I never did it until 2014, because by then the Israelis had denied me entry into Palestine when I was entering as an American citizen. I didn't want to get banned from my homeland, so I obtained the citizenship of my occupier through a legal loophole. Now, I know this all sounds weird to most people, but to us Palestinians, it's very normal. Anyway, I tell you all of that to tell you this. I now enter my homeland as a citizen of the state of Israel. Luckily for now, they can no longer deny me entry. Of course, this also means that they can easily arrest me as a national security threat, which they've threatened to do a couple times, or give me administrative detention. Currently, there's over a thousand Palestinians sitting in jail on administrative detention, and hold me for months on end with no formal charges or due process. In some ways, I wish that they would do this. I've been trying to lose weight. I think a hunger strike would be a very good way. But I can't reach out to my consulate. They're my consulate. My occupier is my consulate. I know this sounds weird to most people, but to us Palestinians, it's pretty normal. Anyway, I'll tell you that to tell you this. I have now returned to my homeland a number of times using my Israeli passport. Now, you would think that, like in most countries, upon arrival, the border patrol agent, who is my fellow citizen, might say something to me like, welcome home. But that's not exactly what happens. Last time I entered, I handed the nice gentleman behind the glass window my native passport. Before opening it, he, he smiled widely. He said a couple words in Hebrew. Now, anyone who goes to Palestine knows that the, they first try to speak to you in Hebrew. If you don't speak Hebrew, they get very upset. Uh, even though it's not a real language, but they, they get very upset. And um, I'll show up usually, and I'll give, I could be, you know, I could be, I don't show up like this, so I could be Jewish, you know. And I give them my passport, and they say, ha, 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 and I say, uh, no, no Hebrew, please, uh, English, or Arabic, since Arabic is an official language of the state of Israel, but not English. And they immediately get very upset. I don't know if anyone here speaks Hebrew. Hebrew is not a very pretty language. Um, it's an it's a ugly language. Uh, does anyone here speak Hebrew? No? Let me teach you a little bit of Hebrew. If you want to know, uh, in Arabic, how do you say I love you in Arabic? It's beautiful, 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 beautiful. It's beautiful. Uh, in Hebrew, it's Ahavotach. Ahavotach. It ends with a Cha. 
Nothing romantic ends with a ch. <laughs> In Arabic, how do you say uh, sweetheart? Habibi, Habibi, Habibti. In Hebrew, motik. <laughs> motik is how you say Habibi. In Arabic, how do you say I miss you? <laughs> it's beautiful. It's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful word. We have a beautiful language. In Hebrew, to say I miss you, you say gagat. <laughs> this is true. And the pub, some people will watch this and verify this is true. Gagat means I miss you. So gagat, gagat. So gagat imotika havotach means I miss you, Habibti. I love you. Ahavotach. Even their I love you ends in a gunshot. Tach. Ahavotach. I gave him my passport, he said a few words in Hebrew, ha, ha, ha. I told him, no Hebrew. I smiled at him, I informed him very nicely in English, I don't speak Hebrew, his, his mood quickly changed. And he opened up my passport and he noticed my quite obvious, and as it turns out, quite annoying Arabic name. He went from visibly happy to noticeably irritated. But then it got even weirder. He looked at my photo, then he looked at me, still very, very perturbed, and he proceeded to pose a question that seemed very weird to be directed to a citizen entering his own nation. He said to me, what is the purpose of your visit? <laughs> I said to him, I'm coming home. What is the purpose of yours? <laughs> I think I ruined his day. When you go around Palestine, you'll notice that there's flags everywhere. Not our flags, those are illegal, but their flags. When you drive on the freeway from Tel Aviv airport down into Jerusalem, Flags. Flag. More, more flags than you've ever seen in your life. I, Tamimi, is staying in a prison called the Ofer Prison. It's right next to Ramallah. It has a big, huge flag. Now, I, don't, I was raised in America. I was raised that you put something, you put a flag on something you're proud of. They put flags on their prisons. And it made me think about reminders. You know, we Palestinians are, that's what they hate about us the most, that we, we remind them. See, if we're all just gone, Israel will be fine, but we remind them. That's what they hate the most about us. That's why they kill us, precisely because we won't bow down to them. Our imprisonment, exile, dispossession, they're not sufficient for them. It's not enough for Israel that we are her victims. We have to shut up too. And for Israel to truly feel secure, our simple surrender is not uh, adequate. We must accept our fate. We, we have to be partners. We have to be accomplices with Israel, and in this thing, we have always refused, very loudly. And that's why we must be killed. But, but Israel can't seem to understand this, despite our very quite clear and consistent message. It cannot fathom that each of us anywhere in the world would trade places with any child in Gaza right now. It can't figure out after decades of anguish why we won't just go away. It, it, it can't comprehend how we have this deep connection to each other that it will never ever understand. They don't know that we live by the words of our ancestor from Nazareth 2,000 years ago, who said, that which you do to the least of my brethren, you do to me. Israel cannot understand why her efforts don't work. Their founding father, you can't blame them. Their founding father, the person that they named their airport after, told them, the old will die, 
and the young will forget. Well, there are old Palestinians still telling us stories. And there are six and seven year old Palestinian children in every corner of the world still listening. On April 9, 1948, exactly 70 years ago, 200 Palestinians were massacred at the village of Deir Yassin outside of Jerusalem. Their murder was meant to strike fear, to silence us, to expedite our abandonment of our own history. But we Palestinians just can't seem to remember to forget. They can't understand why we keep coming back, keep making more demographic threats. We have the highest birth rate in the world. Nine months after every war in Gaza, the hospitals are full. In 1948, when they kicked us out, they tried. They kicked out a lot of people. They almost got all of us. They got 750,000 Palestinians. Raise your hand if you're a Palestinian kicked out in 1948 or your parents were kicked out in 1948. That's us. But 150,000 Palestinians remained in what is today Israel. Now, if those 150,000 Palestinians, if they grew at the normal average global population, just normal average global, they would be today 450, 500,000 people. Do you know how many there are? 1.7 million people. Don't, I always tell people, don't mess with Palestinians. We will outsmart you, we will outwork you, and we will out, we will out love you if we have to. They can't understand why we keep coming back. Being Palestinian comes with a lot of sadness and despair, but it's also the most beautiful thing in the world. And so I see their flags. And I'll end with this. I went to my mom's hometown of Akka when I 